I see, I don't see Ryan or Amanda or Ann or Jaron or James. You had a question, Lizzie? I'll take that as a no. Okay, I'm about half done. Oh, Ann, you're right there. You got to say something. I said your name and got no, or heard no response. Okay, I'm about halfway done grading the exam. There was only one person that got the fire hose problem correct. So I definitely will be making the test out of something like 96 or 97 um, based on that one. Yes, the one person who got it right sitting here saying, oh, I got it right. <laughs> so, so apparently, apparently person who got it right knows they got it right. Um, <clears throat> other things about the test that I just wanted to, to bring out. Um, it looks like people did worse on the um, rotational parts than the other parts. And one of the things that really surprised me was the problem with the box sliding without friction versus the cylinder rolling. That one had a low percentage that got it right. Now, I, I haven't actually graded to see what the answers and explanations were from people. I just know, check the right answer, it didn't. But that's one that we had on our Flip Friday. In fact, you had to answer two ways on Flip Friday. One, by looking at the forces. And if you have something that's rolling and not slipping, then the forces you have on it are going to be a force of static friction, a force of gravity, and a force normal. Uh, that was supposed to be F sub N. <laughs> Forget it. And so in this case, if you look at the net force going down the slope, you have the component of the force of gravity that's down the slope, and it's opposed by the force of static friction. On the other hand, if you have something that is sliding without friction, so I'll just put it here, and you show the forces. You just have the force of gravity and the force normal. Those two forces are exactly the same, but you're missing that force of static friction, hence the net force down the slope is bigger. If you have a bigger net force down the slope, being second loss, then you have a bigger acceleration down the slope. That was one of the two ways you answered on Flip Friday. The other way you answered on Flip Friday was looking at energy. Because in this case, that is the rolling case, you have two kinds of energy of kinetic energy. What are the two kinds of kinetic energy when it's rolling? Kinetic energy rotational and kinetic energy translational. What about if it's sliding without friction? Then you just have kinetic energy translational. So in both cases your potential energy you start with is converted into kinetic energy, but in the case of rolling it's converted into both rotational and translational kinetic energy which means your translational part, the one that has to do with the speed going down, has to be smaller if it's rolling. So we had two different ways that we answered that in the Flip Friday. I, I thought especially having two different ways in the Flip Friday that that one would be a better one. Uh, one, one final comment about the test. I mentioned this just before class, so for instance, Jerry could totally answer this. If you have an astronaut hitting a ball, Kinetic energy is not going to be conserved. In fact, if you looked at that, the ball started with a speed of 30 meters per second and ended with a speed of 50 meters per second. So it, the ball ended up with the higher kinetic energy. If kinetic energy was conserved, what would that mean the man would have to have? Since he started with zero kinetic energy, what would he have to end with? A negative kinetic energy, which means an, an imaginary speed. <laughs> Right? We can't have imaginary speeds. In that case, the astronaut was doing work on the ball and increasing the kinetic energy of the system. But momentum was conserved. That was just a conservation momentum problem because the net force on the man ball system was zero. Hence, momentum was conserved. Okay. Now, I don't have scores yet for the test. It's only about half grade. I just wanted to go over those things. I wanted to hit one final thing about surface tension. Last class period, I talked about the surface tension causing capillary action. 
and I gave a clicker question, which I'm going to give again as soon as we finish this slide. But I thought that it would be beneficial to help you understand surface tension to actually go through the calculation on how high is the column of water in a tube. So we start with what is surface tension? Every time I say what is something, I of course think of Don Knotts and the ghost of Mr. Chicken. Surface tension has its name because you can work with surface tension exactly the same way that you work with tension in a rope. So if I were to talk about tension in a rope, what things can you tell me about tension in a rope? It's what? Okay, the tension in the rope is always in the direction leaving the object. What else? The magnitude of the force is equal to the tension in the rope. So the rope puts a force on any object it's tied to in the direction that the rope is leaving the object. With surface tension, we have essentially the same rule. We have that there is a force per unit length of contact that is equal to the surface tension. So this gamma right here, that's the surface tension. And the force per unit length that is applied is equal to that surface tension. Now let's look at this case of the water column to understand it. So if I look at the contact between the water and the cylindrical tube, what shape is the contact? Cylinder. Uniform cylinder, just the contact. It's a circle. So we're going to have, and I'm going to draw a separate circle here to be clear, looking from the top, then I'm going to have, there's my contact. Now this has, I'm going to change color, a radius of R, so what is the length of that contact? It's just the circumference of a circle, 2 pi times r. Now coming back to our equation, it was force over length was equal to the surface tension. So the total force that I'm going to get from the surface tension is going to be in the direction in which the water is leaving. Now the water is pulling down on the wall then. Notice I put in red. The water is raised in a glass tube because its contact angle is nearly zero degrees. What that means is it's essentially vertical contact. So what direction is the water pulling on the glass? Straight down. If the water is pulling straight down on the glass, what direction is the glass pulling the water? Straight up. So if I go around the circle, my force is always the same direction, which makes summing up the forces as I go all around the circle very simple. I'm just going to say the total force that the glass wall is putting on the water upward is equal to that surface tension multiplied by my contact length of 2 pi r. So that's the upward force provided by surface tension for the water being pulled up by the glass. Now if the water is pulled up by the glass come back to this picture and draw some straight lines. Here's the water level outside of my tube. And here's the water level inside the tube. If I look at the water that is between those two lines, I can calculate the weight of that water. And if I calculate the weight, of course, what's the equation for the weight of anything? Okay, force of gravity is equal to mg. So it has a downward force of mg. And it's going to have an upward force 
equal to what I just calculated down there. So I know it has force surface tension shown two places here, but this is the net surface tension force, the one I called the force up. If this water is going to be in equilibrium, how do those forces relate? Have to be equal. So I'm just going to have the sum of the forces on that little piece of water that's held up is equal to the force up minus, that's not a my sign, minus mg equals zero. Well, what is the mass? Because it's a cylinder, it's going to be the density of my fluid times the volume of the cylinder, which would be the density of my fluid times pi r squared h. So I can take my equation here and say gamma times 2 pi r is equal to, if I move this across, force up is equal to mg. So that's equal to density of the fluid times pi r squared h times g. Now if I want to solve this for the height that the water is going to be pulled up in the tube, by surface tension, just solve this for H by dividing everything that ain't H. And I get the height of the water in the tube is equal to gamma 2 pi r over density of my fluid pi r squared g. I <laughs> forgot to put it over here. Notice the pi's cancel. One of the r's cancel. That's equal to 2 times the surface tension over the density of the fluid times g times the radius of the tube. So the height that it's going to pull the water up depends on the surface tension. The stronger the surface tension, the higher it's going to raise it. It depends on the density of the fluid. If it's a more dense fluid, it's not going to raise it as high. Depends on G, of course, and depends on the radius. And since it's one over the radius, the smaller the radius, the higher it's going to lift it. Coming back to this, you might have lost track of a beginning point. My whole work started with this red line. Water is raised in the glass tube because its contact angle is nearly zero degrees. What would happen if that contact angle, instead of being zero degrees, had been, let's say, 30 degrees? Let's just draw the picture here. What if, instead of being straight up, I had an angle like this that's 30 degrees, so the water's pulling the wall that way. What direction would the wall then be pulling the water? Newton's third law says equal and opposite, so the wall would be putting, pulling that way, and only the vertical part of that would be pulling it up, right? And so I would have to take that and break it into its components. Um, wrong angle. This angle here is the 30 degrees. So it would be cosine of... Nice job. Back. One more. So this angle here is 30 degrees. So it would be cosine 30 degrees times that answer. So I could, in fact, have modified my equation to include if the contact angle is not 0 degrees by putting cosine of whatever the contact angle is there. That helps us understand why mercury is going down. Mercury is going down because the water likes to be touching water more than it likes to be touching mercury. It makes it so its contact angle is downward. So the water is pulling up on the walls. The wall is pulling down on the water. 
pulling it down, and we would have essentially the same equation, but we would, of course, have to change the sign if it's a downward angle. People understand how this works? Let's talk about water striders. I don't know about you guys, but of course, I spend, <laughs> I still spend a weekend every summer at fish camp just outside Yosemite. We used to spend a week with the family there. And you see these water striders just standing on the water. How many people know what I'm talking about? Okay, it's not everybody, but a fair amount. The water striders stand on the water. And if you look at the water striders standing on the water, around each foot you see a little circle like that. What's going on is the water strider is pushing on the water, but the surface tension of the water is strong enough that it's not breaking the surface. It's like you have a rope and you're standing on the rope. The rope is strong enough that you don't break it, and so it holds you up. That's what's going on with the water strider. If, if the water strider gets heavier, of course, what does that tell you about the force the water has to put on it? It's going to have to put on more force. If you look at our equation, the upward force, go back up here, the upward force would have, of course, had times cosine theta here. So as it gets heavier, the upward force has to get bigger, and that hang angle has to get closer and closer to zero degrees. That is a vertical contact. Of course, once you get to where cosine theta is zero degrees, if it gets any heavier, what's going to happen? It's going to sink. And so the actual depth to which it drops in the water, or the angle of contact, has to do with how much force it has to support with that surface tension. So they're held up by surface tension. They walk on water because of surface tension. What could you do that's evil for the water strider? You could put in the water a surfactant. Now, of course, my introduction to surfactants was in physics. <laughs> then when I took my EMT class, we talked about surfactant in the lung. It's the same idea. What does the surfactant do? It lowers the surface tension. If you lower the surface tension, that means that the water isn't going to push up as hard on the poor water strider, and you can make it sink into the water which would be highly confusing for a water strider that's used to walking on the water. Now, because of time, I don't have my cool demos today. I'll probably do them in lab tomorrow at the beginning of lab. But one of the really cool demos I like is to just make a little paper boat and stick it on water. And then I put just a little drop of soap behind the boat. Soap is a surfactant. The whole reason to use soap when you wash your hands or clothes is to lower the surface tension of water. So water can get into smaller areas and hopefully wash away grime. So it lowers the surface tension. If you have that little boat, here's my boat. Okay, I'll make a front end there. If I lower the surface tension behind, then that means the force of the water pulling back is going to get weaker on this side. Whereas the force of the water pulling out here stays the same. What happens if the force in front stays the same, but the force behind gets weaker? It propels it away from that droplet. And you put that little drop of soap in there, and you'll see it zip away. It's really quite cool. Now, of course, you might think it could be surfing. We've all seen people surfing waves. So I always like to drop in a drop of water beforehand so you see that it doesn't go zipping away from a drop of water. See, it's the action of the surfactant. What's the purpose of surfactant in the lungs? Yeah, lowers the surface tension so you can have better access to the alveoli or something like that. It's not like I <laughs> learned everything in my EMT classes. I just tried to pay attention. Okay, so our first clicker question. Why is capillarity more obvious in a smaller tube? Of course, we did have this question yesterday. Just ask it again now that I've explained it very carefully. Not yesterday, Friday. Th Wednesday. Time flies when you're... By the way, Diksha, did you say it's your birthday today? No. No? I could have sworn you did. Next Monday. Next Monday. <laughs> okay. 
It's a good time to have a birthday. My birthday is Friday, the 13th. If you do any kind of mathematical calculation, you see that that's nine months after what date? It's nine months after Valentine's Day. Those of us with our birthdays clustered around this point can probably figure out how we came to be. <laughs> On Friday, it was my oldest stepdaughter's birthday, and yesterday was my younger grand step-grandson's birthday. I think we can all see where this comes from. Okay. We had 19 people that said the weight of fluid in the tube is smaller. One person who said the rise is the same, but the ratio of rise to radius is larger. The rise is not the same. We have that equation that said the height was equal to blah, 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 over blah, blah, radius. Because the weight in the tube is proportional to the radius squared, the upward force was proportional to just the radius, and so the weight shrinks more than the upward force when your radius gets smaller. All right, Bernoulli's equation. Friday, you did a lot of work with Bernoulli's equation. Hopefully you <coughs> learned a lot about Bernoulli's equation. What I want to do here is to go over how we get Bernoulli's equation. Who remembers the method by which Bernoulli's equation is derived? <laughs> I do, I do. I know I should have reviewed this since last Wednesday. I haven't. Bernoulli's equation is derived using energy conservation, basically the work energy relation. So we take here a tube with a confined fluid. If it's a confined fluid, you already know one relation that's going to be true. What's that one relation? The continuity relation that says the flow rate will be the same. So we know that the flow rate, the speed times the area has to be the same at both top and bottom. Now if we have a pressure, pressure 1 here, and a pressure, pressure 2 here, then we're going to have work done. And so we'll start by calculating the work. Work is equal to, what's the equation you learned for work? Okay, work is force dotted to the change in position. The, the dot means it's parallel parts. So if I look down here at the bottom, the pressure's to the right, and in my situation that's given, the water moved to the right, so there's my delta x. That's x1. So the work on the bottom is going to be force 1, x1. Force 1 is the force that's acting on that surface. x1 is the distance it moves. Of course, we need to figure out what that force is going to be. I have a pressure P1. How do I go from pressure to force? Okay, pressure is force over area, so the force is pressure times area. So that's the work done on the bottom side. Now what about the work done on the top side? On the top side, I'm going to have, I guess I don't have to shift up and down because I got the lower picture. The pressure is to the left and it moves to the right. Is that a positive or negative work? That's a negative. Why did I use a positive work for the bottom side? Because they're the same direction. So work 2 is going to be negative force 2x2, two two, which be negative pressure 2 area 2 <coughs> x2. Two. So I have the work done in terms of pressure, area, and x. I'm going to move from the work now and talk about energy. 
what kind of energy and changes am I going to have for this moving material? I'm going to have both kinetic and potential energy changes. So my potential energy, uh, different symbols for a different textbook. My potential energy, one, is going to be mass times gravity times height, one. I better put mass one. My potential energy two be mass two times gravity times height two, right? And finally, kinetic energy, mass one, one half mass one, V one squared. So there I have my equations for Kinetic energy, potential energy, before and after. My mass one, I'm going to change how I calculate the mass. We know, change, actually, real quick, change this to red, <clears throat> maybe. Change this to red so it matches. We know that mass is equal to density times volume. And we know that the volume that I have will be the area, volume one be area one times x1, volume two would be area two times x2, right? <clears throat> and so I can make substitutions for M1 and M2 with that and then say work net equals change in kinetic energy plus change in potential energy. Now hopefully, of course, I've made no mistakes. We'll have not Bernoulli's equation when I'm done here, but we'll have something that is getting us there. So my net work is going to be work one plus work two. You might say, why is there a minus sign? It was because work two is negative. Is equal to changing kinetic energy. That's going to be kinetic energy two minus kinetic energy one. Plus change of kinetic energy, or potential energy. make our substitutions for everything. So I have this long equation. Now how do I go from here? You must be asking me. How I go from here is using the continuity relation that says A1V1 equals A2V2 um, that's a1, well, I actually want to, this is where I should have paid attention. That's actually what I want to do. V1 has to be equal to V2. The volume that leaves the lower side has to equal the volume that arrives at the upper side. And so, a1 times x1 has to be the same as A2 times x2, 
And so as I look through this, everywhere I have an A1X1 or an A2X2, those are all equal. And so I can cancel those out, and all we can see now is that I made one mistake. What was the one mistake? Mass is density times volume. I forgot to put the densities. Whoops, that's the wrong place. I forgot to put the densities here, 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 and here. So if I cancel all of the things that I have underlined, I have the Bernoulli equation. That is, I am left with P1 minus P2 equals one-half rho V2 squared minus one-half rho V1 squared plus rho GH2 minus rho G. H1. And so that's the Bernoulli equation. That's how it's derived. Why do I spend all of this time going through the derivation? Okay, there's a simple answer that it's not because I just wanted to do it. Why do I spend all the time doing it? So we can see that there's a reason for this equation. There's not just some random equation that's been thrown out there for you to take on faith. Right? Taking equations on faith is kind of silly. Right? That's kind of like saying, okay, well, <laughs> I am just going to be a blind follower. I don't want you to be a blind follower of me and my physics world. I want you to actually understand what's going on and why these things occur. So that's why I spend all the time doing this, because it's an important part of you learning physics rather than just going to class and you know trying to pass a class. Okay, another question. What method was used here to derive Bernoulli's equation? <laughs> Thank you, Jerry. Okay, we, we had a lot of people change their answers from incorrect answers, most of them moving toward the correct answer. Everything I just did was work energy relation. Every little bit of it was work energy relation. There's no other way to explain that. I just finished doing it. So here's some examples of Bernoulli's principle in action. These are things that you may or may not have seen. The first one is like at the bottom of a Bunsen burner. You probably all use the Bunsen burner. You are just blowing gas in, and yet you naturally end up with a burnable air gas mixture. How does that work? Because it has little holes at the bottom. And you can adjust how big those holes are to adjust how much air you allow in, but then the question is, why would air go in? Simple answer, Reagan. Why does air go in? Because the speed of the gas lowers the pressure inside the column, air gets pulled. That's right. The speed of the gas lowers the pressure inside, so the atmospheric pressure is higher than the pressure inside the Bunsen burner, pulls it in. The next one, I, I assume that's correct. It's not like I walk around and go, shh, shh, shh. Same idea, you have just air that you're blowing across the top, but that air blowing across the top lowers the pressure on the top of that tube that goes down into your perfume so that the atmospheric pressure in the perfume bottle is enough to push perfume up into that air you're blowing out. Musical instruments, things like playing a flute, work on that same principle. The next one in chemistry class, traditionally to get lower pressures for things like, you know, you've got your, you want to put your filter paper in the, uh, was it Buchner funnel? and you need to have a lower pressure to pull it through, so you use 
a venturi, something that is going to have water just flowing through a pipe, and you put a hole in the side. And the classical human says, you put a hole in the side, you're going to have water come out. But that's not actually what happens, because the water is going through lower pressure because it's moving, and it pulls air into the water. And then the last one, if you go down look at the water heater in your house, you'll see that the chimney for the water heater is not sealed around the um, exhaust from the water heater so that it can pull air up with it. Airplanes and, and uh, sailboats. Now, I, I have been known to follow just about anything that they attach the name sport to. So I used to follow the America's Cup intensely. And the history of the America's Cup is pretty interesting to me. Of course, anybody know where the America's Cup was started? It started in Great Britain. But the Americans won it, like the first year or something like that. And then they successfully defended it for like 150 years. Hence, it got the name the America's Cup because we kept winning. Because apparently, one thing that Americans could do is sail a boat. The America's Cup has a charter that sets forth how the competition works. And the charter has rules about a challenge. The person who wins the cup has to give a challenge within a certain amount of time. And if the person doesn't give a challenge, then anyone else can challenge them to an individual match race, just you and me, and if I win, it's mine now. The idea being that you can't just win the America's Cup and then say, look, we're putting it on the shelf forever. Well, <clears throat> after a close-fought victory, immediately after the victory, I think it was Michael Fay, a guy from New Zealand, challenged the winner without giving them time to even put out their own announcement of the regatta for the next challenge. And by the rules, you're allowed to do that because it's like, well, he didn't put out the challenge, so I put it out. So Michael Fay put out this challenge that we're going to have a race. So it'll just be you, Stars and Stripes, versus me. And the person who makes the challenge gets to choose the specification for the boat. Now, when I was growing up, America's Cup races were always 12-meter races. And the 12 meters is a very complex formula for how they measure you know, the whole water line going this way and this way and adding all kinds of stuff. But that's not in the rules, that's their tradition. And Michael Fay said, open, you can have any size boat you want. And guess what? I have a monster sailboat. Because a monster sailboat can go really fast compared to a smaller sailboat. What he figured was he was going to win this race simply because he had a big racing boat. Nobody could build a big racing boat in the time frame he gave them. And so he was like, they can bring whatever boat they want. My boat's going to win. Well, we'll try to understand the sailboat racing thing so we can get to the conclusion of that fascinating tale of sporting chicanery. So how does a sailboat work? How many people here have actually sailed a sailboat? Okay, two. I took sailing class as a PE class in college. That's my experience. That and then my sister's father-in-law was a member of the yacht club, so we'd go sail around. Um, so I've done a little sailing, but not a lot. A sailboat, we have our physics version of a sailboat, which also happens to be the version of sailboat we used in my sailing class. Just a single doggone sail. That, why do we do a single sail? Because it's easy. If you look at that sail, you notice that the wind, shown here in the blue, is coming over the front of the boat. And you tend to think, wait, that's not going to work. In fact, back in the day, you know, like back when Eric the Red came and was the first European to discover the Americas, they were just using like square cut sails and when the wind's behind you, it blows you. But if the wind's like in front of you, you don't go anywhere and you pull out the, the oars. Believe it or not, in graduate school, there was a guy ahead of me who still didn't believe 
<laughs> that sailboats work this way, which was astonishing. Um, anyway, so the sailboat, you have wind coming over the front of the boat. How can you make the sailboat go? Because you have a sail that you sheet in so that you have the air flow around the sail. And on this side here, the air has to deviate out. So the path from here to here has to bow outward. Let me change to a non-red color. <laughs> so the air has to go like this in a bowed path, which lengthens the path. On this side, the air tends to go in a straight line, so it's a shorter path. That's exactly what you have in an airplane wing as well. In the airplane wing, the air go on the bottom just does a straight path from here to here. The air on the top does a curving path, and so it's a longer path. Now, of course, as both a sail goes through wind or a wing on an airplane goes through the air, essentially the air molecules are sitting here and go, bloop. But the one that has to travel a bigger distance does it the same amount of time as the one that has to travel the smaller distance. If it has to cover a bigger distance in the same amount of time, what does that tell you about the speed? It's faster. faster. So the air on the curved side of the wing or on the arc, the um, convex side of the sail, travels faster. According to Monsieur Bernoulli, what does that tell us about the pressure on that side? It'll be lower. So you have lower pressure pushing down on the top of a wing than you have pushing up below. Or you have lower pressure on the bowed out side of the sail than you have on the concave side. Now we can calculate force. Force is equal to pressure times area. That area is just the cross-sectional area. It's essentially the area of the shadow you would get if you shone light. Well, it doesn't matter which side of the wing you shine the light on, you're going to see the same shadow. So the cross-sectional areas are the same, but the pressures are different. So the side with the higher pressure is going to make a higher force. So on the sailboat, you're going to have a larger force, and it's shown in their arrows, but I'm going to make my own. You're going to have a larger force pushing this way than you have pushing that way. Now, what's that naturally going to make the sailboat do? Yeah, it would make the sailboat naturally accelerate this way. Not what you want, is it? So what else do you have to have in the sailboat to make it sail straight? Okay, not just a rudder. You do have a rudder to help you steer, but a typical boat with just a rudder would still probably go the direction close to that net force. Anybody? I had two people raise their hands. Hannah and Michaela. Okay, Chad's got his hand up. Okay, you call it a belly fin? Okay, a keel or a dagger board. Dagger board is what we called it in my sailing class. We had a board that fits in a box in the center of the boat here. Okay, that's a horrible color. Black would have worked better. We had a board that goes right here and sticks down about six feet into the water. It was called a dagger board because it's just something you jab down there. And so that is going to give you a force like this to oppose the force pushing you sideways. Now, of course, that force is down below the boat. The force pushing you sideways is above the boat. What's that going to do? going to make you rotate, right? That's making what we call a couple. A couple is two forces in opposite directions that are separated. So that makes you rotate. So the, bowl, the boat naturally heals up. That is, it tips. And so when you're sailing the boat, you have to have people who are hiking, standing out here holding onto a rope, giving it a counter torque to keep it from flipping over. I tell you, in sailing class, we love that so much that we would actually have one person hanging out here and two people hanging out here so we could really have fun. This person here is hanging their head in the water and these two are up high. and It's really cool. 
Now, if you have a keel, that keel will be filled with a dense metal. <laughs> if you're a racing boat, it probably is going to be something like spent uranium because it's really dense. You're not going to put gold in there because it's too expensive. Why do they put that really heavy metal or dense metal down there in the keel? To keep it, to give it the counter torque to keep from healing up. So you have the force from your keel or dagger board that's that direction, the force of the wind on one side that way, the other side this way. You add those together, your sum of your forces is going to be that plus that plus that. And so the net force ideally is forward. So there's your force net. So you have a net force forward. Hooray! What's the net force forward going to make you do? Go forward. But as you go forward, you start going through the water and you get a water drag force. So then you have an additional drag force from the water. And that force of drag is going to be proportional to how fast you're going. So you will speed up until what condition is met? Until what? Okay, terminal speed, which means the net force is zero. So this drag force, you'll speed up until that drag force equals this net forward force you're getting from the others. So your speed is determined by the ratio of the forces you're getting forward from the sail to the drag force. Now, we've got that America's Cup story hanging, right? What can you do to speed up your boat? Okay, add more sails. The more sail you have, the bigger the area, hence the bigger the force. So add more sails. Bigger boat can support bigger sails. What else could you do? Right, Michael Fay only thought that far. Cut down the drag. Cut down the drag. Well, how do you cut down the drag? You make a cat boat. A catamaran has two pontoons instead of one big one in the center with the keel. Catamarans don't need a a keel, because in a catamaran, looking at a catamaran from on top, here's one pontoon, here's another pontoon, in between you have your structure with a little trampoline so you can have fun, All right, well, so you can move across, and then you have your sail coming up in the center. And if you have wind blowing like this, you have a broad reach, then it just starts tipping up and lifts one of those pontoons off of the water. You just have the other one in the water. You have counter torque because of the weight of that pontoon hanging out here. And of course, you have everybody on the boat climb up on the one that's in the air to keep it from flipping more. And you can get a much, much lower drag force. And so the American team said, they just said, bring whatever boat you want. They made a catamaran. And then Michael Fay tried to take them to court saying, but that's not in the spirit of the rules. But he had already violated the spirit of the rules by trying to issue a challenge before they had a chance. Anyway, the court agreed that that was a ridiculous, you know, if they were going to go by the letter of the law, so should the American. And so they had a race between this huge boat and the much smaller catamaran. And the much smaller catamaran destroyed them. And now, of course, the America's Cups are always raced with catamarans because, hey, once, <laughs> once they start doing it, they saw how much fun it is to go super fast. And they do all kinds of things. Has anybody seen America's Cup boat? Okay, they, a few years back, they had the America's Cup in San Francisco, and I was there right after they finished. So I was, you know, looking in the places where the boats had been. But those boats are really complicated. And one of the things they use, use is hydrofoils. A hydrofoil is basically a little wing that you put in the water that you tip it up and you rise up and you get those pontoons out of the water and you just have this little wing in the water. What's that going to do to the force of the drag? It makes it virtually zero, which means that your forward speed is almost unlimited. Those things can really, really go fast. I told you about the grad student that was a year ahead of me in grad school. He didn't think a boat could be able to go faster than wind speed. But it's not the wind speed that's setting your speed, it's the drag force compared to the forward force. And so you lower that drag force and you can easily go faster than wind speed if you have 
a well-designed boat. Okay, well, I'm out of time, and I got through a very small section. Let's finish with this clicker question and go home. Which aspect below results in lift on an airplane wing or the force that moves a bolt forward? It's, uh, it's not? Well, let me tell it to start again. <laughs> Please? You're right, it says pulling closed, but... Okay, let's not answer. I hit to open the polling like seven times, nothing happened. Correct answer is greater pressure below than above. All right, have a great Monday.